Welcome to the Plain Talk Podcast. I'm your host, Rob Port. We have two interviews this show, but before we get to them, an apology. We, uh, I didn't have a show yesterday, and the fault is all mine. I had some technical difficulty on my end, and I actually ended up losing some audio that I recorded for the show. I wasn't in a position where I could re-record the, the interview that I did, so uh, it's just lost. Uh, I'm sorry about that, and it didn't really leave me a lot of time to put anything up for yesterday, and so uh, we just had to skip a day for the show. Hey, what can I say? Doing this podcast, it's a little bit of a learning experience for me. But on this show, we have two interviews. Uh, the first is Senator Ray Holmberg. Now, Senator Holmberg uh, holds a an important position in North Dakota's legislature. He is the chairman of the Senate Appropriations Committee. Now, as we come into the end of the legislative session, that committee is going to be, well, one of, obviously, their, their counterparts in the House of Representatives is going to be very instrumental in uh, a lot of the final budget decisions that get made. So uh, Senator Holmberg occupies an, an important position, and with new revenue forecasts coming out this week, I wanted to talk with him about that and get sort of his take on what the rest of this legislative session looks like. Also, I interviewed Nick Archuleta. He is uh, the head of North Dakota United. Now, North Dakota United is the combined public worker and teacher unions, and they obviously have a point of view on this issue surrounding the, uh, I, I guess what some are calling a mistake, uh, what some are saying is a, was, was, was an error in, in allocating oil tax revenue funds into some of the state's uh, trust funds, uh, no, notably the Common Schools Trust Fund, the Budget Stabilization Fund, these funds have a pretty big impact on schools, and Mr. Archuleta obviously represents teachers, and they have a, a point of view on that. Now, uh, up to, and, and Mr. Archuleta certainly downplayed this during our interview, but it is, I, I think, a very real possibility that if the legislature doesn't address this issue, we could end up with a lawsuit against the state over this issue. So it's it's not it's not a small issue, and you'll hear him talk about that a little bit later in the show. No rant on this show because we have two interviews and I don't like these episodes to get too long. I like to keep them between a half hour and 45 minutes if I can for your uh, ease of listening. So we'll get right into the interviews now. This episode of the Plain Talk podcast is brought to you by Energy of North Dakota. Oil and natural gas from North Dakota strengthens all of America. And through our abundance of talents, innovations, and technologies, energy responsibly produced here translates to worldwide economic stability. With producers and our communities working together, we're securing a sustainable future that generation after generation can build on. It's all happening right now with Energy of North Dakota. Learn more at energyofnorthdakota.com. State Senator Ray Holmberg, a Republican from Grand Forks, joins me now. Now, Senator Holmberg is also the chairman of the Senate Appropriations Committee, and we're coming to the point in the legislature, uh, and I, uh, Ray, I, I think you, you work hard all legislative session, but we're, we're coming up on the point where we're really getting, I, I guess, our final um, revenue forecast before some, some real budgeting decisions are going to start to make, and, and the work of your committee, I think, kind of begins in earnest right now. Um, you, you've got some revenue forecasts in hand. And, and it's time to really start making some, some tough budgeting choices on uh, on these issues, right? Correct, correct. What did yeah, you... Th- we're, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, we're set to go. Where do you... Um, we, we, have, we have one forecast in hand. We have another one due out today. Um, how, how are you... Are, are you, are you going to see... Is there going to be a lot of daylight between these two? We had two... We did this earlier this year where we had you know, sort of the executive branch forecast and then the legislative branch forecast. And I think the consensus most people say is, well, we're going to try to live in between these two forecasts. Are you expecting a lot of difference between these two? I think there'll be a little daylight here and there, and I think there will be similarities uh, because when um, the the company that's visiting with us today, they talk to some of the same people, uh, you know, in state. Uh, the some of the same ag people, some of the same oil energy people that Moody's uh, talked to. So I, I think there will be some differences. Um, uh, how their experts look at oil, for example, or the ag economy. So there will be some differences, and I don't know if we take a ruler and go right down the middle. 
because uh, we have to evaluate exactly what it is they say. Um, there was a lot of, uh, of course, press coverage of the Moody's item yesterday. And, um, you know, it was fairly accurate, although I would say that too much emphasis was placed on the increases. Uh, the governor's budget uh, office said there's going to be a billion more dollars of oil money coming into the state over the next two years. Uh, but what wasn't focused on is where that money goes. It Most of it does not go to general government. Right. Uh, that, that billion dollars that they talk about, that's the money that, first of all, goes to the legacy fund. It goes to, you know, various constitutional funds, the Foundation Aid Stabilization, Common Schools Trust Fund, Resources Trust Fund. It goes to counties and cities that in lieu of property taxes out west. So by the time you take all that, which is already taken off the table, uh, you have about $300 million left. And of that, $230 million is spoken for on the prairie dog bill which is in the process of of having its final vote in the senate in a couple of days so yes the billion dollars is a lot of money but it already goes into mostly constitutional funds which we can't access right well and and we're i mean there's, there's even a cap on how much of that revenue flows into the general fund anyway right i mean it, it's not going to exceed what are we at? We were at three hundred million for a long time. Where are we at now? Is it like four hundred, five hundred million? I'm forgetting. Um, well, three hundred is what we look at. Okay. Um, and that's what we have utilized in the past, and that has varied a little bit. But we also want to make sure that our budget stabilization fund, which we drained, you know, in the last session, that we get that back up to a safe level. Are we? Are you thinking that these forecasts are going to really change the trajectory much of of the budgeting the budgeting decisions that the the state's going to make? Because obviously we've already been working on these bills. We're we're past crossover now. Um, we 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 had a forecast from earlier this year. Are these forecasts going to change much in 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 the final outcome? Well, I think it'll help give a little more clarity to exactly where we will be uh, spending our money. Um, we have a number of, of uh, <laughs> excuse me, issues that are kind of bubbling and waiting for these numbers. So, uh, yeah, we'll be working on them. State employees compensation, do we make changes there? Uh, uh, there were a number of initiatives the governor had that we still haven't uh, done anything with at this point, whether it is a uh, presidential library or is it, uh, you know, moving a prison from New England? <coughs> so we have some of those initiatives that we still have not resolved. One of the initiatives that I, I think is pretty well encased now is the fact that the, what used to be county social services will now be working in coordination with the state, and <coughs> we will not have the 53 county social service agencies anymore. Um, <clears throat> and that is a property tax reduction at the local level of up to 20 mils. Yeah, I mean, that's that's all that's all good news. In, in terms of, I, I mean, I, I feel like politically these forecasts can almost become sort of fodder for rhetoric right so if if if, if the re if it comes in and the revenues are higher and, and, and both forecasts are showing that the revenues are higher than a lot of people expected then maybe the case for an initiative like the library gets easier if it comes in and things are lower or more pessimistic then maybe maybe those arguments get get harder do you do you agree with that yeah i i think it uh, psychologically i think there was a uh modest encouragement yesterday because I think most or many legislators know that uh, this is still just a projection and we don't want to get too far out on the limb. 
uh, embracing because, you know, we're talking about, for our economy, two very volatile commodities, oil and agriculture. Speaking of that, you know, we went through a period where, you know, I remember back during the oil boom years, you know, we couldn't, the revenue projections couldn't project enough revenue, right? We were, we were coming in and we were like a billion dollars over projections, more revenue than, than what the forecast said that we were going to get. And then we came through, you know, the, the, the bottom kind of fell out of oil for a while there. We had some tough sledding for, for agriculture and their, and their commodities. And then it seemed like it was the opposite problem where we couldn't find the bottom for how low revenues were going to go. The forecast kept coming into and, and, and the, the common theme there, both when we were we, we couldn't project enough revenue and then we couldn't you know, we, we kept projecting too much. The, the common theme there was was accuracy of the forecast. Do you feel like we're doing a better job of that? And in fact, that's why we have two forecasts now. We didn't used to do a legislative forecast. It used to just be an executive branch forecast. Now we're doing two as a second opinion. I, I think generally that's a pretty good idea. I mean, to me, more more data points and more eyeballs might might make for a safer projection. Uh, but, I, I mean, are, are, do you feel like we're doing a better job with these forecasts now? I think I think we are, and I think the um, – uh, the uh, actual numbers of how we're tracking are very, very close to the legislative uh, budget numbers that we uh, put together last session. You know, now we're working essentially on the upcoming session, but we are very, very close to what we said last year was going to be the amount of money that we would have. So we're doing a much better job, I think, and having two sets of eyes on it is, is I think, healthy. But at the end of the day, I mean, the governor has his numbers, and he promotes them and talks about them, and that's his job. But at the end of the day, the, the revenue forecast is set by the legislature, and that's what we will be doing uh, this Thursday. We will say, okay, this is how much we can expect in revenue. Uh, and then we will vote on it. And once we've done that, then that's where we go. Right. And and that's uh, because I and, and again, I this is all a little complicated. And, and we'll be talking about here are, are revenue projections. And this is how much money we think the state is going to collect in, in revenues. And then you folks are going to make the legislature and, and ultimately the governor will sign the bills are going to make decisions on, OK, well, this is how much money we're going to spend on this, that and the other thing. I don't think people always appreciate how complicated this gets sometimes when you start talking about all the different proposals, because we've got a library proposal. We've got a proposal to move uh, a women's prison out of New England. We've got uh, a proposal that passed in the state house to use legacy fund earnings uh, to start buying down the income tax. I mean, there's a lot of different moving parts here. And if you approve one bill that has implications for other bills, sorting this out at the end gets really, it gets really, really complicated. It's, it's a little opaque frankly, to, to people probably standing outside in the public trying to observe the process. Right, right. And it is, but at the end of the day, we, um, using the best information we have available, we have to make decisions. And uh, like I say, this Thursday, we will decide our revenue is going to be X, and that's what we work on. But keep in mind, it's constantly monitored during the interim, and if you recall, uh, a couple years ago, uh, when the bottom kind of fell out of both ag and energy, uh, there were allotments and there were there was usage of the uh, rainy day fund that we have. Uh, so that is uh, there as a backstop. And the governor always has the option of calling us back in right. to a special session. And hopefully we keep talking about we're going to save days so that the legislature can call itself back in. Yeah. But we don't always have the will to do it. Right. Uh, I, I, I remember some of those sessions where we were going to save days and then we're on the 80th day and it's two in the morning. And um, the, uh, the the 80th day turned into almost a two day affair. <laughs> but we, um, exactly. we I, I wanted I wanted to ask um we is, is there going to be any con I mean if, if we run into an issue where because we do all these projections but we're projecting for two years in an economy where again 
things are pretty volatile. I mean, things can happen very quickly in oil. Things can happen very quickly in agriculture. If, heaven forbid, we get a, 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 a terrible drought or something, uh, things thing, fortunes can change very quickly in, in, in ways that, that nobody can really project for. I, I'm interested because it, during the last interim, we had a little, we had a legal fight between the legislative chamber and the executive branch over vetoes, uh, and then all, also over the power of, of interim committees. I mean, is, is the legislature's ability to make decisions in the interim without call, being called back into a full session, has it been, do you have the same amount of power at this point? I, I think that the legislature, you know, everyone is take, keeping scorecards. The governor's office, I won four things and, and lost one, and the legislature says we won four things. Uh, bottom line is the legislature learned a few lessons from that court case, and one of them is that we have a budget section that is to uh, help uh, monitor what's going on during the interim, and the legislature had frankly given too much power to that body. And one of the things we're working on is we have legislation that it appears the court would be fine if the legislature gave specific uh, directions to that budget section rather than leaving it wide open. So we've worked on a fix for that. Um, they're, they're still, because the bills have been killed, there's still the reluctance for the legislature to automatically say we're going to have annual sessions. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of people out there. Would you support annual sessions? I know every once in a while there's people out there saying, well, everything's too complicated and things move too fast. we got to start meeting every year. Is that something you'd support? We can do it now. Uh, we have 80 days in the Constitution. If the legislature had the will, they could say, okay, we're going to meet 60 days you know, in uh, 2021, and we will meet 20 days in 2022. I mean, we can do that ourselves. Yeah. Uh, typically, though, when they talk about annual sessions, uh, there's also a discussion that, well, let's add some days. And you and I both know that government will fill the number of days they have, as the legislature has demonstrated by hitting right up to 80 days uh, on many occasions. Uh, last question. What do you feel about the House? I, most of the people I'm talking to, the House passed again, like I mentioned earlier, the uh, using legacy fund revenues to buy down the income tax. House passed it by a pretty wide margin, but most people are telling me it's 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 not going to get a very warm welcome in the Senate. Is that your view? Uh, my view is this. I can go around and talk to Senate members who ran for re-election this year, ask them how many people have said anything about the income tax in North Dakota being too high? And the answer is none. I campaigned this time, never had a person talk about the uh, income tax. They do talk about property tax and, and certainly are watching that carefully, even though it is uh, a local tax. They certainly have turned to the legislature to help out in that area. But it's not the income tax that they're talking about. Senator Holmberg, thank you for your time. You're welcome. Thank you. This episode of the Plain Talk podcast is brought to you by Energy of North Dakota. Oil and natural gas from North Dakota strengthens all of America. And through our abundance of talents, innovations, and technologies, energy responsibly produced here translates to worldwide economic stability. With producers and our communities working together, we're securing a sustainable future that generation after generation can build on. It's all happening right now with Energy of North Dakota. Learn more at energyofnorthdakota.com. Nick Archuleta joins me. Nick is the head of North Dakota United. That is uh, the combined organizations representing uh, some of North Dakota's public workers and some of North Dakota's uh, teachers. Uh, for understandable reasons, they have been following the issues surrounding uh, the North Dakota Land Board, and what what some are saying is is as much as 137 million dollars that were shorted from uh, two constitutional funds related to schools. Now, this has been an issue over the last 
a couple of weeks, I've had uh, Jody Smith on this podcast. She is the head of the North Dakota Land Board to talk about that. Uh, in fact, uh, on the same episode, you'll hear uh, Senator Ray Holmberg uh, address the issue as well, head of the uh, Senate Appropriations Committee. But I wanted to get um, Nick's reaction as well, because obviously, again, these two funds are our backstop education funding in our state and so if there were funds that weren't available that that should have been in those funds um well that's that's an issue nick how you doing i'm doing very good rob thank you so much for having me on sure certainly why don't you give me just your top level reaction to all of this where, where are you guys at right now well right now rob we are hoping that the legislature uh fixes this this issue uh clearly uh this i don't believe that there was anything nefarious that was done on on anyone's part. I don't think there's any fault to be found. Uh, when you're running a government this size, there are going to be some oversights and there's going to be some uh, things that might get dropped once in a while. So um, we certainly don't believe that there was anything intentionally, uh, any sort of malfeasance that was intentionally committed here. Uh, but we do believe that uh, it is an important uh, thing to do two things. One of them, of course, is to clear up that ambiguous language that, uh, that uh, Treasurer uh, Kelly Schmidt uh, has credited for the the mistake being made, and the other one, I think, is to uh, repay, or I shouldn't even say repay, but make sure that that money that should have been allocated to the Foundation Aid Stabilization Fund and the Common Schools Trust Fund, uh, that money does need to be replaced. Why don't you think anybody caught this? And and when I hear Treasurer Schmidt talking about this, like like you said, she says that there's ambiguous language. She says that she has sought fixes for that language in previous legislative sessions. Uh, she says that, that she sought advice from the attorney general's office. Everybody seems to be saying, well, there's there's no fault to be found here. And, and I agree with you. I don't think there's any malfeasance here. But why was it this addressed earlier? I mean, if, if the treasurer is saying, hey, you know, I was asking the legislature to fix this. She's obviously not a lawmaker. Why didn't anybody flag this? Was your organization aware of this when, when she said, like, I, I think it was the 2011 session she was saying she was she was pushing this. I mean, is do we know why this was overlooked? Uh, we don't, and I think that would be a good question for uh, the legislator, uh, legislators to whom she appealed uh, to to uh, clean up this ambiguous language. Uh, we haven't, in fact, uh, tracked this before. We had great confidence that the land board uh, was uh, making sure that the constitutional buckets that they're in charge of, uh, uh, namely the Common Schools Trust Fund as well as the Foundation Aid Stabilization Fund, uh, were receiving the monies that in the Constitution says that they should be receiving. Um, that the, the ball got dropped here, as I mentioned before, I'm not terribly surprised that I mean, it's a complicated system. Um, and sometimes these buckets can be confusing. Uh, so, um, I, I think that the question you're asking is a good question and, uh, it probably should be put to, uh, legislative leadership. We, you, you said, you know, you want two things. You want to clear up the ambiguous language. I think everybody's in agreement on that. Let's figure out how we're going to make sure we're, we're doing this the right way going forward. And everybody knows what that way is. But the other part of it is make sure the money is replaced. And that, I think, I, I think the first question has probably not an easy answer, but a pretty straightforward answer. The second question, though, is, is, is an open question at this point. What, what does a good fix for this in terms of replacing the money? What does it look like to you? Is it when I had uh, Jody Smith on, you know, she talked about maybe paying it back over time. Um, I've had other lawmakers, you know, tell me that they're concerned about the lost opportunity because obviously, um, you know, these, these funds generate interest, you know, $137 million generates a not insignificant amount of revenue in its own right, just, you know, from the ways it's invested or whatnot. So they're talking about, you know, the lost opportunity costs and wanting to pay it back further faster. I, I think just, just reading some of Governor Burgum's comments, I feel like he's very much in the let's pay it back very soon camp. What, what, for, from North Dakota United's perspective, what what looks like a good fix to you guys? Well, I, I think that uh, from, from our point of view, Rob, and I think this is important, uh, we are we don't have we are not set on a specific plan to pay that back, but we are insistent that that money does get paid back. Um, if it's going to take uh, two or three or four legislative uh, or biennium to pay that back, that would be fine with us. But you're right, there is a missed opportunity once that money isn't in. Uh, in the fund uh, collecting interest, um, you know that is an opportunity lost. And it's important to note too that these two funds are are, uh, are very very important to education. If you take a look at the Common Schools Trust Fund, Rob, I mean that that fund was established. It's in the the Constitution for a reason. That is the fund that we use to guarantee 
uh, strong public education, K-12 education, in perpetuity. That money is invested, and it is not for this generation. It's, it, well, not entirely for this generation. It is for generation after generation after generation. So it's important that that uh, fund stay healthy. Um, and right now, I think we're drawing down something like a quarter uh, of the of the $9,460 uh, per pupil payment. A quarter of that money comes from uh, the uh, from the Common Schools Trust Fund. So it's important that that money is there. Uh, the Foundation Aid Stabilization Fund, um, we leaned heavily on that uh, last uh, biennium uh, to make sure that K-12 schools were held at level funding. Not not harmless, I mean, because the cost of their doing business was up, but their funding remained constant. Otherwise, you would have seen the same uh, 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 you know cuts in, in budgets that we saw at the university campuses, that we saw in state agencies around, so between 20 and 25 percent. That would have been devastating for many school districts. So those these are really super important uh, uh, funds, and and so we we uh, insist that they they stay whole. You're right. We use these funds. North Dakota has an unpredictable economy, mostly because we're we're so reliant on commodities, the energy industry, the agriculture industry, and so it it tends to be a roller coaster. And we can have a debate about how to diversify our economy. In fact, we have for a long time, and that's a topic for a whole another show, but. The reality is what it is. Our revenues can go up and down and very quickly as we la- learned over the past few budget cycles. So, yes, these, these funds are very important. Um, and, you know, we yeah, we did. We, we basically emptied the budget stabilization aid fund last session to, to make ends meet. Um, the Common Schools Trust Fund is, is you know, backstops and, and by the way, impacts property taxes. Right. That 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 thorn in the side of the public that we see is like we're <laughs> endlessly debating property taxes. Um, the Common Schools Trust Fund is being a part of the the per, per pupil funding m- formula. Um, you know that that has an impact on on property taxes. So could you say that that by missing some of these revenues, maybe property taxes ended up being higher than than, than they needed to be? I, I don't know. It, it, there's a lot of variables. It gets very complicated. But um, I, I think you're right. I mean, saying that you know, making sure that these two f- funds remain whole and, and get all of the money that they're legally ob- you know that we're legally obligated to, to be putting in them is is hugely important and you know obviously we weren't doing that how we make that right is is the question now when i was reading your our, uh john hageman's article in the grand forks herald um you mentioned that at this point you're not thinking about litigation but obviously you're keeping your your eyes open uh or you're keeping your options open uh you said i quote the legislature has the ability to fix this thing now it doesn't have to go to litigation now i've heard some lawmakers say we shouldn't we shouldn't appropriate any money, you know, whatever happened in the past, we're just going to move forward. If that were to happen, I mean, is that something that would trigger you, you folks looking at litigation? Well, I tell you what, Rob, the, the uh, we are very hopeful that the legislature will uh, have a, a vigorous uh, discussion about this issue, a vigorous debate, um, consult whomever they need to consult to, to see what does the constitution actually say about this? And uh, is there, uh, any way to avoid litigation in this, I, and I, I and I believe uh, in my heart of hearts that at the end of the day they'll come to the conclusion that it is it's just a lot better for everybody involved to uh, to come up with a plan to repay these monies. Okay, with that said, we will certainly follow the lead of the uh, whatever the land board decides to do. Uh, and here's the thing about both the Common Schools Trust Fund and the Foundation Aid Stabilization Fund, they're they're so tightly interwoven that I don't believe that it's possible uh, to, for example, the, the land board, they have a fiduciary responsibility. And if right now, and I don't know if I wasn't in their closed session, obviously, but if, if, um, uh, if their feeling is that their, their fiduciary responsibility requires them uh, to make sure that that money is paid and they're only left with one option, and that is to litigate this, um, I think you can't find for or, or against the land board's position without finding for or against the uh, the foundation aid stabilization fund also being funded. So um, we're going to see what the legislature does before we uh, even have a real serious discussion about litigation. Um, but I, I would, and I'm hopeful, I'm very hopeful that we can avoid that. Uh, but it's basically in the legislature's hand now. Yeah. I don't, I don't think, I mean, my sense of just from talking to lawmakers, I, I don't, I don't feel like the let's do nothing crowd is, is going to win. Um, and not that they want to do nothing, but you know, the, the let's not replace any of the funds. I don't think that there, it seems like most people are on board with, 
we got to put some money into these funds. I think the question is, is how much and, and over what amount of time and, and things like that. So I, I think you're right. I'm, I'm hopeful that the outcome is going to be here. Now, would your group have, I, I'm not a lawyer, but I mean, would your group have standing to, to, to file a suit if, if, if for some reason we were to come out of this and you didn't feel like the legislature was, was, was holding to their, you know, legal responsibility to these funds, your group would file a suit or how, how would that work? Well, you know, I'm I'm not a uh, that's another thing we have okay. in common, Rob. I, I'm also not a a lawyer, uh, and I hate this to uh, you know put our lawyer under any sort of obligation okay, based sure. remarks I might make. But um, we would certainly uh, investigate that to see if if we had standing to be sure. Um, and and but again, as I'm saying uh, to everybody that asked me, we're confident that the legislature will rise to the occasion and and come up with a solution to this that will avoid all sorts of litigation. Yeah, well, I I agree, and I I, I feel like we're going to get some sort of a solution, and, and hopefully, it's just regrettable, I guess, that we're in this position, but um, it is it is what happened, and and apparently nobody noticed because I don't I don't remember the legislation from the 2011 session either to fix this. Um, Apparently, your group wasn't tracking it, so I don't know. It slipped through a lot of hands, and uh, probably if there's any blame, uh, there's a lot. Maybe there's plenty of blame to go around. I don't know. Um, <laughs> Nick, I I thank you for your time. Well, thank you, sir, and, and I appreciate you uh, giving me a call, and uh, I enjoy your show. That's it for today's Plain Talk podcast. Remember, new episodes come out Monday through Friday, or Usually Monday through Friday. I apologize for missing a day this week. Uh, I do my best to release them daily. And that's certainly my goal. Uh, they come out right away in the morning on the days they are out. And if you want them delivered directly to your devices, just pick out the podcasting service of your choice. Search for Plain Talk with Rob Port. You ought to be able to find it. If you're having trouble, email me, Rob, at sayanythingblog.com. I would be happy to help you out. Also, if you have any feedback on the show, if you have any questions for our regular guests, Senator Kevin Kramer, Congressman Kelly Armstrong, you can send those questions to that email address or just email me and say hi. I like it when people say hi. Thanks for listening. We'll talk again.